everybody. Uh, I just want to start by saying um, how much I appreciated Anthony Lee's paper this morning, uh, partly because it was so, so very excellent, but also because it set the scene for what I'm going to talk about. It makes my job very much easier. Um, this paper is based on research I have recently undertaken into the small finds from Roxeter Roman City in Shropshire. And as Gail has encouraged us to get personal, I will just explain that um, until three years ago, I had no form with uh, Roman small finds. Um, and that was not what I was looking to do research into. I was, in fact, looking to pick up where Jane Evans, our next speaker, had left off with the, uh, the Roman ceramics from the Graham Webster excavations. However, because we had a change of storage um, facilities um, in the new store, access to the bulk archaeology on the main racking became difficult and problematic. Um, and they arrived, I arrived at a point where I thought, you know what? The only thing I can sensibly work on is the things I can access myself. And that is where I changed direction. Uh, so here we are looking at Roxeter. Latterly, Roxeter was the fourth largest city in Roman Britain. The defenses enclosed an area of 78 hectare, hectares by the end of its expansion. Uh, and you can see here in this gradiometry survey showing the negative features, the clear evidence of the intensity of use and the density of the habitation. Um, uh, and uh, towards the end, uh, it had an estimated population of between five and 10,000 people. Um, there were 19th century excavations um, focused around the very obvious upstanding remains known as the old work. Um, and then there were more serious excavations undertaken by Bush, Fox, and Atkinson either side of the First World War. Uh, but Roxeter is extremely well known for the research excavations that took place there in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, this aerial photograph shows the focus of those excavations. Uh, Insula 5, they excavated pretty much all of Insula 5. Um, the Pleistra, the enormous exercise hall attached to the baths was where Phil Barker did his groundbreaking excavations. Um, and Graham Webster, here is Graham Webster cropping up yet again, um, concentrated on the Bath Suite, um, the McKellum, and a number of other associated buildings, latrine and um, tavern. So basically, they took on the civic center of the city as it was uh, when it had when it had been completed towards the end of the second century. Um, the English heritage collections from Oxeter are mainly from these later research interventions. And you can see here the museum, uh, which dates to the 1970s, not long after the site had been taken into state guardianship. Where am I? Most of you, sorry, what happened? No, right. <laughs> Most of you will be aware of the changes that have taken place at English Heritage in the last few years and that the organization is no longer a quasi-autonomous non-governmental body but has become a charitable trust. Part of what was agreed to with central government was the provision by them of a lump sum to address the maintenance backlog and to fund the upgrading of the display and facilities at many of the sites. The intention here is to put English Heritage in a position where it can be self-sufficient by 2023 when all government subsidies cease. A lot of work has been done already with big projects at sites like Tintagel, but one of the sites still to be addressed and much in need of updating is Roxeter. Um, the collection for Roxeter is the, the largest single collection held by English Heritage and it has important research publications supporting the collections, providing the context for those finds. But the museum display is a 1990s tweaking of the original 1970s display. Too many little objects crowded into cases, extremely limited interpretation, and Hessian everywhere. 
Um, there are um, nine cases, and they all have very simplistic themes. The conquest, the military, the civilian town, death and religion. Um, so, we have until 2023 to undertake the reinterpretation, reinterpretation of the museum and the wider site. And I have been getting ready, undertaking new re research on a number of subjects, one of which is the evidence for magic. And that evidence is mainly in the form of amulets and is extensive. And the key theme that appears within the amulets is a widespread belief in the evil eye. The majority of the amulets from Roxeter incorporate an image of the phallus. The phallus representing the god for Sinus is well known as a Roman good luck symbol and crops up frequently. Earlier on this year, there was press coverage of one carved into the face of a Roman stone quarry on Hadrian's Wall. But the use of the phallus is more specific than just good, a good luck symbol. It was used specifically to protect against the evil eye. So rather than being a generalized wish for good luck, the image of the phallus, and also images of the vulva, uh, though there are fewer of these, these were used to deflect the bad luck that came from being cursed by the evil eye. The evil eye was transmitted from the eye of a usually envious observer, often in the form of a sidelong glance, and the thinking behind these depictions of genitalia was that they were literally eye-catching and would provide enough of a distraction to the evil eye to make it light on your graphic amulet and thereby pre prevent it from meeting and entering your eye. Amulets are often worn near the face, usually around the neck, uh, to further distract the evil eye from one's real eye by proximity. These objects are all amulets from Oxeter. The use of amulets was of great antiquity and had been popularized in Egypt from where the practice spread to Greece and Rome. Their strength could lie in the materials from which they were made, the imagery used, or invisible factors such as magic incantations set over them. Amulets were usually worn or carried by the owner, there being additional protection in having them in physical contact to your body or your clothing. But all the amulets seen here are mounts for horse harness. A horse was an expensive and important possession, and horses were known to be targets of the envious evil eye. <clears throat> the belief in and practice of magic was ubiquitous in Roman Britain, and in terms of the artifactual evidence, it was firmly based on imported Roman beliefs and superstitions, principally the evil eye. This assemblage of amulets is a recent find from Pompeii, the contents of a box which I think was probably the stock held by a dealer in amulets. Almost every object seen here was to one extent or another defense against the evil eye, either because of its imagery or because of the material it was made from or even because of its color. Blue is a very protective color. You see a lot of blue objects in there. There are many written accounts from antiquity relating to the evil eye. Most often it was attributed to, as I've said, these feelings of, of envy manifesting in a bolt of malign energy uh, that emits from the envious observer's eye and is tra transmitted into the eye of the receiver. And people who bragged about their good luck or their lovely child, they were tempting fate and inviting the curse of the evil eye. But the evil eye was also alarmingly random. People with the evil eye were usually believed to have been born with it and were not necessarily aware that they possessed it. There are accounts of people giving the evil eye unintentionally and of mothers who, believing their husbands could transmit the evil eye, as obsessively shielded their children from their own father's gaze. It was thought possible to give oneself the evil eye by means of the reflection in a mirror. Foreigners and those with abnormalities of the eye were also suspected of giving the evil eye. Individuals to be thought to be most at risk from the evil eye were those at an early stage of development and showing great promise. Children were very prone to the curse, as were livestock and crops. Also at a higher risk of being cursed were those in dangerous occupations, principally soldiers. The evil eye was held accountable for all the disappointments and losses in life, the failure of children to thrive, illnesses, animal deaths, crop failure, bad weather. Accidents were only infrequently held to be the true cause of injury. You might trip and fall by accident, but if you cut your leg in falling and it didn't heal, then that was because you had been cursed by the evil eye. Other than the amulets, is there evidence of the belief in the evil eye at Roxeter? 
we have this amazing piece of relief carving, unprovenanced, but probably from the exterior of a domestic building that consists of a phallus with both legs and wings, pulling a wagon full of little phalli. And at the back end of the main phallus is the manofica. Uh, right, so the wings, the legs, uh, the cart it's pulling full of little, little phalli. And at the back end of it, the, the manofica, the fig hand, also known as the manus obscena, the obscene hand. This image is often used in combination with the phallus, the double whammy. What this depicts is a fist, a symbol of male strength, with the phallic thumb pushed between the vulvate second and third fingers, a gesture clearly referring to the act of sex. This image was considered so rude by writers in the 19th century that one refused to use an image of it in his volume on the evil eye. This combination of the phallus and the manofica is seen particularly in military amulets of the first century and particularly in these mounts used on horse harness. Um, so, this is um, an epiphallic mount, and this, I would suggest, probably came from the center of a, of a headpiece of a, a, of a horse's, I don't know what to call it, actually, but a um, uh, horse's um, headpiece. Um, and these are um, mounts to be put onto some of the straps that were part of the, uh, uh, the, the horse harness. Um, that one's in copper alloy, so you can see it very nicely. And you can see that, interestingly, it has um, a, a bangle, which looks very much like one of these early glass bangles. Um, so it all shows up very well in the more expensive copper alloy version. Um, and then we have another four or five examples in bone. And um, I have recently suggested that it could be that this is how they were held in place um, on the straps of the harness uh, by using these toggles with a, a bit of textile or rawhide or something coming up from under to keep it all in place. Uh, so here's the phallus again. Um, this is a later object than the military amulets we've just seen. Um, and the phallus appears here um, on a security seal for a money bag rather than um, a seal box for, for uh, documents. Um, and I think this is a very apt use um, if, if the issue is, is envy. Um, you will want to protect your cash from envious eyes, uh, really, I think, usually more than you will want to protect your documents. So um, most, but not all of the amulets from Roxeter relate to protection against the evil eye. There are two pieces of women's jewelry with phallic images on them. They're very tiny, I haven't shown them here. But in general, um, amulets that can be identified as being specifically for women's use are medical amulets like these two in jet, um, here, the one in the uh, form of the scallop shell, which is a visual reference to the uterus, and it's also a sort of uh, mythological reference to, to Venus and therefore to childbirth. Um, and here, very clearly, we have a breast made in jet, which had a little um, sh perforated shank at the back to hang f uh, from a cord around one's neck. There's also a distinct group of amulets for children uh, that also protect, protected against the evil eye as well as other threats. Bells worn by children to protect against the evil eye are mentioned by various authors in antiquity. Amulets made of teeth protected against teething pain as well as the evil eye. Uh, this is two more examples um, of a, two examples of another form of medical amulet pairs of eyes in plate metal, one in gold and the other in copper alloy. Uh, these would have been applied to a rigid backing and hung around the neck. This type of amulet is often referred to in the literature as an anatomical votive. Uh, but these uh, were not from any votive context. 
Um, anything can become a votive object if it occurs in a votive context, having been deposited there in a ritual act. As we see at many Romano-British religious sites like Bath, all sorts of things were thrown into the water. And thousands of iron nails found, they become votive objects only upon deposition. These pairs of eyes have been called ex votos, uh, mainly because they're similar, there are similar examples from sites on the continent where there was a much stronger tradition of anatomical votives being deposited at sacred sites. <clears throat> Because the sheet metal pairs of eyes are so often called votives, when Barker and his colleagues noticed in excavation the many pieces of wall plaster deliberately shaped to resemble an eye, and there are 105 of these from Phil Barker's excavations, uh, these were also interpreted as, interpreted as votive objects and have gone down in the literature for the last 50 years as an unusual and unusually numerous example of anatomical votives, given that ana anatomical votives were not common in Britain. The excavators noted the recurring details by which they identified the eyes, including the fact that they had been shaped on the reverse side so that they fitted into one's hand and could be conveniently held or carried. Revisiting this question of the presumed votive eyes recently, I looked at both the context from which the eyes came and the wider assemblage of finds from Roxeter. The plaster eyes came from many different contexts and cover a wide date range. There is no excavated evidence at Roxeter for any focus of cult deposition. In addition, the suite of classic objects used for ritual, de ritual deposition at shrines, and we saw some of those from Colchester, things like the, um, the, 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 the feathers. Um, these, these hardly occur at all at Roxeter. So a different interpretation was required, and I suggest that these also are amulets specifically to protect against the evil eye. Uh, and in fact, the, the evil eye, amulets to, to protect against the evil eye always take the form of a single eye. And if you have a pair of eyes, that is most unlikely to be protection against the evil eye. It's much more likely to be a, a medical um, amulet. Um, so these are freely accessible to anyone who wanted to make one. You don't have to buy an expensive amulet. You can wander out to a fallen bit of wall plaster, find the right one, and it will do the job for you. They come in a range of sizes with many smaller examples for children. They were probably carried in a hanging pouch or a pocket sewed to one's clothing. Because they were shaped in the hand, they could be held without being observed to give you protection that only you knew about, or they could pre be produced and deployed in order to deflect the evil eye. Though they are unusual, these eyes did not exist only at Roxeter. There are a few from South Shields, again, not in any votive context. There's one made of Samian from Roxeter, which we see on the left. And I would suggest that this section of deer antler from one of the sites in Canterbury is another of the same kind of thing. You, also, you often see in Fines reports mentions of unfinished objects with marks from supposed incomplete perforations. And I think maybe we should all be revisiting our mystery objects with possible unfinished perforations, as well as bulk collections of wall plaster fragments, because I do believe there will be a lot more of these out there. So what do these Roman images mean to a modern audience? You might giggle at the graphic phallus plus rude finger gesture up at the top, which is not a rocks that are fine, sadly. Um, so, so that is an image that retains some kind of effect. Uh, the capital on the left with the multiple heads from the forum at Roxeter, you might glean something of the brooding power of those faces, the strangeness, the otherworldliness of their multiplicity. But what about the others? Um, one, of our, one of our plaster eyes, an eye is a symbol with many possible interpretations. The all-seeing eye of the deity, could be, could be quite b b benevolent. Uh, it, it could be an anatomical votive if it, if it came from a site on the continent. The Medusa, well, that's rather a, a pretty one um, in this case. Um, it, may not, it may not suggest anything other than a lovely object to you. And as for the amber horn, well, you know, what to make of that other than that it is very attractive. You would only know that these objects afforded protection against the evil eye if you had been taught that from infancy. 
And this belief in the evil eye is, of course, still current in countries around the Mediterranean. Tourists in Greece and Turkey probably know that the blue eye Bascania they are purchasing is to protect against the evil eye, though they may not have much of an idea what the threat of the evil eye actually consisted of. The horn is more obscure now as an anti-evil eye symbol, and these earrings were purchased by one of my daughters in complete ignorance of their meaning, and they are made of coral, which of course is also uh, a, a protective material. In these Mediterranean countries, they still deploy the most intangible of defenses against the evil eye, gestures, the manofica, the horn, and <coughs> spitting three times always works. In Northern European countries, the evil eye has lost the very specific meaning that it had in the Roman period. And by the medieval period, it had become just one aspect of the practice of witchcraft. The source of the evil eye was then always witch, and most of the curses attributed to the evil eye related to agricultural problems, milk going sour, crop failures. In Britain, belief in the evil eye carried on through the 19th century, particularly in rural areas, with some older people still believing into the early 20th century. Shropshire, where Roxeter is, is mentioned as a place where there was a particular belief in the evil eye and its powers to do things like curdle milk and sour the butter. Um, on the right, we see um, a, an extensive series of taper marks um, around this doorway in uh, a room above a 19th century dairy at Boscobel House, one of the English heritage properties. But that is all long gone now, unless someone here tells me differently. If people brought up in the Northwest European countries or from that background know anything about the evil eye, then chances are it will be from encountering it while traveling abroad. So how do I talk about it to an audience here? Looking forward and wanting to incorporate much of this material into a new display, how am I going to make that work? So witches are one obvious way in. Um, see here on the left, a Roman mosaic showing um, a witch. Showing, it's showing a scene from a play. All three figures are wearing masks, and the one on the right is, is clearly a witch. Um, and, and the transaction that's probably going on here is that the witch is um, providing them with, um, with, with some erotic spell, because that was most of their business. Um, most of them, the, the way they made money was, was through erotic spells in the Roman period. Um, and a late medieval print showing weather witches, because that was another thing that witches were supposed to be able to control was, was the weather. Um, but as we've seen in the Roman period, witches were by no means the only givers of the evil eye. Disnified, even slightly scary Harry Potterish witches aren't what I'm talking about. <clears throat> there are many horrible, really horrible written accounts relating to witches in the Roman period and their practices. Much of it is from plays and other works of fiction, but not all by any means. There are legal documents that discuss these things. Body parts, animal and human, Animal parts that needed to be taken from the animal while alive to work, because if you are taking the eyes of an animal, you want the live animals because that's, they're not going to work if they're dead. Um, these were commonplace. That was you know, absolutely basic stuff. We have evidence from Roxeter of fragments of human bone. Um, I think it's getting on for 100 now. There's a few of them on the left. Um, and these uh, come from a whole range of contexts. And they are exactly the, the, the pieces of human bone that you would expect to find. They are the easily detachable bits in that they are the, 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 the digits, the fingers, the toes, the, which is part of what you see. Um, and also the skull, the, the very important skull, so useful for, for magic practice. So these, uh, a lot of these occur. Um, the kidnap and murder of children from body parts, that is much mentioned. Particularly, there's a particularly horrible account of starving a boy to death, and boy's souls worked best for magic, to get his liver to use in a love potion. Uh, the instructions include putting food nearby, but just out of reach of the desperate yearning, of, as the desperate yearning of the child as he starved to death enhanced the power of the magic. So I want the audience to take this, this issue seriously, but I don't want to give them nightmares. I don't want to traumatize people. So how do I make this meaningful for a modern audience, particularly for the younger audience, which of course is what we are looking for, I think. It could be that this mosaic um, from Antioch is the nearest thing I've come to 
to a useful explanation. That the evil eye is so bad that every kind of defense against it is needed. But what do I do about the hunchback with the enormous phallus? Um, I that might be going too far for a modern audience, or, or is it just me? Um, so, so I would like to ask, you know, would, would, is there any, anyone out there who would condemn me if I cropped out the, 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 lucky, the lucky hunchback with the, with the enormous phallus? Oh, it's a difficult one. Um, so we will finish there, and, and um, you know, I am very much, it's a plea. If you have useful experience, if you have suggestions, I, I would love to, love to hear them, uh, because I will, need, I will need thoughts in the next few years. Um, so I will send you away um, with, this is um, obviously not from Rocksitter, this is from the Royal Collections held at Osborne House, but um, th this little amulet, uh, he, he wishes you all good luck and protection against the evil eye as you travel home this evening. That's it.